Hello to you. I do hope you're well. Welcome to this A-level religious studies revision video. I'm Ben Wardle and today we are going through the consolidation questions for natural moral law. So we're going to cover everything you need to know about natural moral law and we're going to do that by going through 30 consolidation questions. So we'll be starting with those ancient Greek and Stoic influences. We'll be looking at the four tiers of law, the five primary precepts, the secondary precepts and of course we'll be looking at those A to evaluation points as well. So what different scholars have said about the strengths and the weaknesses of natural moral law. And we'll be concluding with a look at the doctrine of double effect. So as I say, we're going to cover everything you need to know about natural moral law for the exam. And we're going to do that by answering these 30 key consolidation questions. So what you might like to do is pause the video here and actually print off the consolidation sheet for yourself. You can do that by clicking on the link in the description box below. And then you might like to actually have a go at answering the questions. So just see how much you do already know about natural moral law. And then you can get a different colour pen and then fill in any gaps in your knowledge as we go through the answers in this video. And then of course, add in additional knowledge as well. So that your entire consolidation sheet is filled with brilliant A-star knowledge that is going to help you in the exam. So let's get started, shall we, with question number one. And question number one is asking us, what is the difference between teleological and deontological ethics? So, of course, this is quite a broad ethical question, uh, you know, and it's going to help us with all of our ethical studies and revisions for the exam. And of course, teleological ethics are those concerned with the consequences and the outcomes of actions. And of course, utilitarianism is an example of a teleological ethical theory because it's all about making that calculation of what action will bring about the greatest good for the greatest number. So if it's teleological, it is outcome and consequence based, whereas deontological ethics are concerned with the act itself. It's that idea that certain things are in intrinsically good and that other things are intrinsically bad. So we can also know this as duty based ethics. And that's quite a good way to remember this in terms of the two D's there. So deontological means duty based. And of course, it is Immanuel Kant who we should instantly be thinking of when we think of deontological ethics, because his Kantian ethics is, of course, an example of deontological ethics, that idea that we have certain duties that we need to perform at all times. For example, it is always wrong to lie. It is always wrong to steal, irrespective of the circumstances. And you'll remember Kant's distinction between hypotheticals and then categorical. So the categorical imperative that categorically, you know, it is always wrong to lie. It is always wrong to steal. So just a really important distinction that we always need to keep in mind whenever we are talking about ethics is this distinction between your teleological ethics, which are based on consequences and outcomes, and your deontological ethics, which is where you are only concerned with the act itself and the intrinsic morality of that particular act. OK, so question number two is a really important one, actually. Who was Aristotle? Because remember, you know, we think instantly when we think about natural moral law about St. Thomas Aquinas, don't we? Because, you know, he in the 13th century, he developed those five primary precepts. And, you know, he is our key man. He is our main man, if you like, with natural moral law. But we have to remember it doesn't begin with him. You know, it goes back all the way to ancient Greek and Stoic philosophy. And our key thinker here is Aristotle. You know, Aristotle had a massive influence on the entirety of Western philosophy, but he had a really big influence in particular on St. Thomas Aquinas. And we see this with uh, Aquinas's cosmological argument as well, for example. So St. Thomas Aquinas, very heavily influenced by Aristotle, who was one of the founding fathers of Western philosophy, he was, as I've put here, an ancient Greek empirical philosopher. So another key term that we use a lot for this A-level, don't we? So he was based on gaining knowledge through observation via the senses. He was a student of Plato, but he became a critic of Plato's ideas. You know, they differed on so many things. For example, beliefs about the soul. You know, Aristotle thought that uh, the soul was part of the body. He was a materialist, a monist, whereas Plato was very much a dualist, wasn't he? He believed that the 
the soul had been imprisoned in the body and that, you know, the body was a source of endless trouble for us. So he believed that you had this soul, which was eternal and imperishable and that wanted to return to the uh, realm of the forms. And then he saw the body and the senses as a source of trouble for us, whereas Aristotle was very happy to embrace the senses and to, you know, embrace the body because he believed we could gain knowledge via the senses. Whereas, of course, for Plato, he believed that all knowledge is remembering because we can't trust our senses to tell us anything. But more on that in the other videos where we are focusing more on that comparison between Plato and Aristotle. Uh, Aristotle was also the author of a book called The Nicomachean Ethics and the founder of the Lyceum School. Um, really important as well if you're studying virtue ethics. So, you know, on the AQA specification, we study virtue ethics and the Nicomachean Ethics is where he develops that idea of virtue ethics ethics and the idea of cultivating good character and that the focus of ethics should be on the cultivation of good character within people so that they then know how to make moral decisions and they instinctively do the right thing when they are navigating the world and going about their lives. Now, Aristotle didn't just write about uh, philosophy and ethics. He wrote extensively on biology, psychology, ethics, physics, metaphysics and politics. And he continues to have an enormous influence on modern thinking today. In terms of what we really need to know then, in terms of our studies of natural moral law, he influenced Aquinas because he believes that everything and everybody has a telos, and telos means a purpose, a final goal. So he believes that the universe itself has a telos, a purpose. He believes that was moving towards the prime mover, and he believes that everything and everybody in the universe has a purpose. So there is an inherent purpose. For example, a chair has a purpose. You know, that purpose, it's final cause, its telos, is to provide a seat for somebody. And he believes that for human beings, our purpose, our telos, our final cause is eudaimonia, which is a state of supreme flourishing and happiness. Um, and again, Aquinas agreed with him on this, although Aquinas believed you could only fully achieve eudaimonia after death in heaven. So let's just unpack these ideas a bit more, shall we? Question three, define telos with reference to Aristotle. So the word telos, as I've said, means purpose. And he believes that everything in the universe has a purpose, and that includes us, and that the universe itself also has a purpose. And as I said, he had a massive influence on um, Aquinas in many different areas, not only natural moral law, but also the cosmological argument, for example, because he believes that everything is in a state of motion and everything is moving from a state of potentiality to actuality. So everything at all times is in motion and is moving because it is moving towards fulfilling its purpose. And as I put there, our purpose as human beings is, and I hope you're shouting it at the screen, it is eudaimonia. So that leads me on to question four, because um, question four is to define eudaimonia with reference to Aristotle. And he believed that eudaimonia is a state of well-being, of supreme happiness and flourishing. So it is not just being happy because you've just enjoyed your favourite meal or, you know, you've just watched a great film, for example, or you've just won some money in, you know, the lottery. This idea of eudaimonia is, you know, going beyond that temporary happiness. It is this state of supreme happiness, of flourishing. When you've fulfilled your full potential, you know, you feel fulfilled. You feel that you've been the best that you can be. So, you know, you've fulfilled your potential, if you like. So he believed that our ultimate telos, our ultimate purpose, our end goal as human beings is to achieve eudaimonia. So that means, as I say, fulfilling your full potential as a person and feeling supreme happiness and fulfillment as a result. Now, interestingly, in the 20th, 20th century, someone called Abraham Maslow, a key uh, businessman and psychologist, came up with this idea of a hierarchy of needs, that human beings have this hierarchy of needs that they need to fulfill. And at the very top of that hierarchy was something called self-actualization. And he believed that that is ultimate happiness for human beings. That is what we should be striving for. And he says not everybody will fulfill that in their lives. But, you know, that is our ultimate goal. That is what human beings 
are ultimately seeking. It's not enough just to fulfill your basic needs for food and shelter, for example. You need to then actually achieve self-actualization, which refers to the realization of a person's full potential and becoming the very best that you can be. So that we can trace all the way back, can't we, to Aristotle and his idea of eudaimonia. Now, another really important influence on natural moral law is Cicero, OK, who was a Roman philosopher. He was, well, no, not just a philosopher, do excuse me. He was also a statesman, a lawyer and a writer. So very important. Um, and he asserted, and this is such an important quote when it comes to understanding natural moral law. This is a quote that, you know, you want to get down on a post-it note. You want to get highlighted and you want to be ready to use this in your essays because he said, you know, there will not be one law at Rome, another at Athens. He said there will not be one law now and another later, but there will be one law, both everlasting and unchangeable, which will be binding upon all nations and all people for all time. So obviously you don't need to memorise the whole thing. You're going to want to paraphrase it, aren't you? That Cicero said there will be one law eternal binding upon all nations and people at all times. So what Cicero is saying here is that there should be this eternal law that all people follow. And, you know, it should not be there's one set of rules in Rome and another set of rules in Athens. And that, you know, in 100 years, those rules are going to change in both places. He believed very strongly there should be one universal law. And of course, you should instantly be thinking of Aquinas' eternal law here and the idea that those primary precepts he creates are universally binding, that everybody has to follow those five primary precepts, that they are objective, they are absolute, they are eternal. And so Cicero here is laying the foundations for natural moral law being universally applicable. And this is seen as a strength of natural moral law, that it is a universally binding approach to ethics, that everybody follows the same rules. Um, and, you know, we see this in what he's saying here when he says it's going to be a law that is everlasting and unchangeable. So the law isn't going to change depending on where you are or, you know, what time period you're living in. He is saying here there should be one universal eternal law that is binding upon all nations and all people for all time. And of course, it's really important we remember that when we're talking about natural moral law. That really helps us to understand what natural moral law is all about, this idea that we can all know, using our God-given reason, according to Aquinas, this natural law that is universally binding, that we all need to follow. And as I say, that is seen as a strength because it means that natural moral law is universally applicable and universally binding. So it's relevant for all people at all times, um, in all places. So, Let's now have a look at our main man, St. Thomas Aquinas. So who actually was he? And I've mentioned here that you should refer to the Catholic Church. You can't ever really talk about Aquinas without mentioning the Catholic Church because the Catholic Church continues to be heavily influenced by him. And one example of that is natural moral law. You know, so much of the church's decision making and teaching is grounded in Aquinas' ideas. So who was he? Well, he was a 13th century philosopher and theologian born in 1226. He was a doctor of the church, so a very important man, very influential man in terms of shaping church teachings and doctrines. He wrote a book called Summa Theologica, which is uh, a translation there being Sum of Theology. So, you know, this book covered absolutely everything you could ever possibly want to know about God and religion and religious ethics. So a really, really foundational work of theology there. He was, as I've mentioned, hugely influenced by Aristotle and his ideas about telos and his you know, foundations of the natural law, but then also on other issues such as the cosmological argument. And he attempted to synthesize, so he attempted to bring together uh, Aristotelian philosophy with Christian principles. So as we say, he was very interested in the ideas of Aristotle, but of course, Aristotle was an ancient Greek philosopher. He was not Christian. So what he tried to do was synthesize, so bring together, amalgamate, if you like, those key Aristotelian ideas with what he was reading in the Bible and, you know, what he believed as a Christian. And as part of that, he developed natural moral law. And he's been described by Anthony Kenny as one of the greatest philosophers of the Western world. So very high praise indeed. And of course, we're talking about him today in the context of natural moral law. But it's important to remember 
but he has been influential you know, in many more ways than just developing natural moral law. As I say, the cosmological argument that we also study for the philosophy of religion is also associated with Aquinas. And you'll also look at him when you're talking about um, the conscience as well, for example. So yes, he was a very busy man. He had a lot to say and he wrote a lot about theology and ethics. So a really important question, number seven, what did Aquinas believe about the role of human reason? Because he believed that there was something that made human beings unique. Obviously, as a Christian, he believed that humans had been made imago Dei, in the image of God, that they had been set apart from the rest of creation, that they were the pinnacle of creation. But why was that? He believed it was because we have this God-given ability to reason. Other animals are, you know, following their instincts and, you know, their following their basic desires, where he believed that human beings have this extra special capacity and ability to have consciousness, to have self-consciousness. And, you know, it's their ability to use reason. It's their cognitive capabilities. It's their brains that set human beings apart from the rest of creation. So as I put here, the species defining characteristic, that's quite a nice phrase to use in the exam, isn't it, to impress your examiner. He said the species defining characteristic of human beings is our ability to reason. And he wrote that the light of reason is placed by nature and so by God in every man. So God has placed within us this ability to reason and he calls it the light of reason the idea that that is what guides us and illuminates us and helps us on our way as we navigate through life and he says it should guide him it should guide humans in his acts so we have this ability to reason to think to consider to reflect to evaluate and to make judgments and that is what reason is and he says that is what god has given us and um from aristotle so again he's you know being influenced here by aristotle aquinas drew the belief that human beings should use their god-given reason to discover how they should behave to appreciate the existence and um the nature of natural laws and the human ability to choose to follow them and flourish to go against them and fall short so again, Again, hopefully you're seeing how he was influenced by Aristotle, because Aristotle had that idea of eudaimonia and flourishing. And Aquinas believed that it's by using our God given reason to work out what God wants us to do that we can move towards flourishing. So, for example, he believed we should use our reason to determine the difference between real and apparent goods. So it was very important for him that people are being autonomous, that you're not just blindly following rules, um, but you're actually thinking for yourself because he believed that reason is a gift from God, you know, and we've got to use that and we've got to be thinking for ourselves, making judgments, making decisions, and those decisions need to be moving us towards flourishing and fulfilling our full potential, you know, as opposed to, um, you know, leading us down the wrong path where we actually fall short of God's glory and we fall short of our full potential. So let's have a look now at how he then actually develops um, natural moral law. So, you know, we're going to look at the four tiers of law and the five primary precepts, which are, you know, very much the core of natural moral law, aren't they? So in any essay on natural moral law, you're going to be referring to your four tiers of law, your primary precepts, and then, of course, your secondary precepts. So Let's start with the uh, four tiers of law, which we always think of as a triangle with eternal law at the top, because the eternal law, and hopefully you're thinking of Cicero here as well, and that idea of there being one law eternal, it is law as known in the mind of God, his knowledge of right and wrong. Now, this for Aquinas is actually beyond human comprehension and understanding. So I know we've just said that he believed in using human reason, but he believed there were limits to our reason because humans are ultimately fallible and, you know, they they are not perfect and so this eternal law cannot actually be comprehended and understood by us but he is confident it exists because he believes in God and he believes that this is the eternal law in the mind of God and when you talk about meta ethics you will obviously be looking at you know is goodness objective is it subjective obviously for Aquinas here goodness is objective there is one right and there is one wrong and what is right is that which is in the mind of God so you know there is this eternal universal understanding or uh, consensus if you like of what is right and that is the law as known in the mind of God now as I say we can't fully understand that we can't really understand it at all so we have to then see it 
through the divine and the natural laws. So they are the revelations, if you like, of this eternal law. So although we can't comprehend or understand the eternal law directly, we then have the ability to see it and understand it through its revelation in scripture, which is the divine law, and in nature, which is natural law. So you've got this, you know, this uh, absolute eternal law at the very top, which is the law as known in the mind of God. And then God reveals that to us through the next two tiers. So the next tier is divine law. So this is law revealed by God through the commands and teachings through revelation. So we get to know a bit about the mind of God, don't we, when he speaks to us, for example, through scripture in the Ten Commandments or through Jesus, who is God incarnate in the Sermon on the Mount. And of course, that is all contained in the Bible. So that is why Aquinas would see the Bible as very important and why a Catholic would see it as the infallible word of God, because it contains the divine laws. It's the opportunity to understand and see what what God's law is because he's revealing it to you through scripture we then also have natural law and this links in with empiricism which again Aquinas gets from uh, Aristotle because it's that idea that we can use our senses to observe the world around us and so natural law is moral thinking that we are all able to do in accordance with our observation of nature and what is natural. So we summarise this as right reason, so using your God-given reason in accordance with nature. And this links in, doesn't it, with the design argument and the idea that you can know about God's characteristics through observation of the world around you. For Aquinas and natural moral law, this is the idea that you can know about God's laws through observation of nature and the natural world around you. So, you know, God's law, the eternal law is revealed to us through divine law and through the natural law, through the natural world. And we've got to use our reason to interpret that, to make sense of that and understand it. And then finally, of course, we have that final, that bottom tier of law, which is human law. And they are customs and practices of a society and they're devised by governments and societies. Now, Aquinas famously believes that if a human law contradicts the natural law, so the law of God, you don't have to follow it. So he was prepared to break human laws if they were not in alignment with, if they did not correspond with, the natural law with God's laws and that shows you I think very clearly that hierarchy there that those human created laws are at the bottom and at the top in contrast is God's eternal law which is then revealed through the divine law and the natural law but yes a great link here as well to metaethics the great synoptic link here because of that key idea that morality is therefore objective. It is fixed. It is unchangeable. So, you know, a really great criticism of this would, of course, be emotivism and the idea that morality is actually nothing more than the expression of a personal opinion or preference in the same way that you might say you like a certain food or you prefer a certain chocolate in the celebrations box. You know, so emotivists, would be very critical of this because they would say there is no objective source of morality. Moral judgments, moral preferences are simply expressions of personal feeling or emotion. OK, so let's have a look at number nine now, which is another important question. What is Aquinas' synderesis principle? And this idea, the synderesis principle, is the idea that Aquinas had that humans have an innate, so an inbuilt, it's within them, desire to do good and avoid evil. So for him, that is the key principle. That is the synderesis principle, that people have a tendency to do, seek and move towards goodness and to move away from evil. Evil. And again, this links in with Aristotle and that idea of movement from potentiality to actuality, that we are all in a state of motion. The world is in a state of motion. And he believes that human beings are naturally moving towards fulfillment. Excuse me, I can't speak towards flourishing. So they have this tendency to seek goodness. And so he wrote this. This is the first precept of law, that good is to be done and pursued and evil is to be avoided. So if you think about natural moral law, I think that sums up what those five primary precepts are all about, because the five primary precepts Aquinas believed will help you to pursue good and avoid evil. And he believed that is what human beings are here to do. That is our tell off. That is, you know, our purpose on this planet to do good and avoid evil. 
and he believed that all other precepts of the natural law are based upon this so that whatever the practical reason naturally apprehends as man's good or evil belongs to the precepts of the natural law as something to be done or avoided so all that he's saying here is that in every decision you make and in everything that you do you should be uh, pursuing good and you should be moving away from you should be avoiding evil so that should be the focus that should be the priority for all of us in everything that we do, that everything we do is about doing good, pursuing good and avoiding evil. And he believed that that is our synderesis principle. So that is an innate principle within us. And he believes that, you know, the way we achieve that is by following the five primary precepts, which are here for you. So these five primary precepts are absolute they are unchanging and they are binding as cicero would say upon all people at all times so aquinas believed and this is as i say at the core of natural moral law that there are five primary precepts that all people must follow at all times so everybody needs to follow them and if they do they will move towards good and they will avoid evil so the first of his five primary precepts, which he believed should be followed by everybody at all times, is the preservation of life. So he argued that we are to preserve life. He said it is evident that life is important, both our own and that of others. It is natural and reasonable for every person to be concerned with preserving their own being and preserving human life. And of course, we see that expressed in the divine law, don't we, through the commandment, do not kill. So it's very clear to Aquinas that we have this primary precept, this primary duty at all times to be preserving life. His next one then, his second one, is reproduction. He believed it is rational, it is natural to ensure that life continues. And this is the main purpose, telos, of sexual intercourse. And for example, if you're using the natural law tier of law, you can use empirical observation to see that all species reproduce. Yeah. And so that tells us that that is what God expects us to do, that moving towards good means reproducing. Um, and this is a really interesting one because it has shaped Catholic teaching on things like contraception. Uh, the Catholic Church says that contraception is intrinsically evil, for example, because it closes the sex act to the transmission of life. The Catholic Church believes that every sex act must remain open to the transmission of life. It is also the reason that they are opposed to homosexual acts, because again, they are not procreative. So this is a really interesting one, actually. Does everybody have a duty to reproduce? Is that what we should naturally be doing? Is that what we have a duty to do? And is that the only way that we can move towards goodness if we uh, reproduce? Interesting to think about the link there with what science now tells us about evolution as well, which is that key idea that humans exist to survive and reproduce. So, you know, could Aquinas have been onto something in terms of evolution all the way back in the 13th century? The next one then is the education of children. So this is the idea that we all need to be educated and that it is a primary precept. It's one of those five primary precepts that must be fulfilled. So he believes that humans are intellectual creatures. Remember, we've got that God-given reason that sex was apart from every other animal. And it is therefore natural for us to learn. And if we look today, we see this in the UN Convention on Human Rights, which asserts that every child does have a right to education. We then have ordering of society. This is the idea that we need to live in an ordered society so that every society needs to have a hierarchy. It needs to have rules. There needs to be a order to it. So he said that we are social beings. So human beings don't live in isolation. We live in groups and it is good to live in an ordered society where it is therefore possible to fulfill our purpose. So we can't fulfill our telos. We can't achieve eudaimonia if we are not living in an ordered society, there needs to be rules to protect people, to provide stability and structure to their lives and to society. And we can see this in the fact that every country in the world has laws. So again, this is another one of those one law eternals, because if we look around the world, every single country does have a system of government, a system of rules and laws. And then the final one, which is probably the, the most controversial one, is the worship of God. Because, of course, remember, with these primary precepts, Aquinas says they are universally binding, that all people need to follow them. And of course, we know that in the world today, not everybody does worship God. 
So he believed to recognize God as the source of life and to live in a way that pleases him is one of the five primary precepts that we must fulfill in order to live a good life and to move towards our uh, sense of eudaimonia in order to achieve our full potentials. And of course, we know that today billions of people do worship God. But of course, and this is going to be one of the weaknesses we look at, it therefore suggests that Aquinas' moral theory, his entire system of ethics, depends on theism. It depends on belief in God, not only because of that eternal law at the top, where he's saying that all morality is actually derived from the mind of God, but also with his primary precepts. You know, how can you encourage somebody who doesn't believe in God to see these five primary precepts as universally binding? Because if they don't believe in God, they're not going to think it's natural to worship God. Because if you don't believe there is a God that exists, why would you be worshipping that God? So you could argue that Aquinas' natural moral law and his primary precepts only work for theists. It only works for somebody who already believes in God. So actually, it's not a universally relevant and universally successful theory of ethics. OK, so we then need to think about our secondary precepts. So from these five primary precepts, which are absolute and unchanging, we then have the secondary precepts. And they are rulings about things that we should or shouldn't do because they either uphold or fail to uphold the primary precepts. So these secondary precepts, as the name of them suggests, are derived from the primary ones. So these are your more specific examples. Um, so, for example, do not steal goes against the primary precept of the ordering of society. Do not use contraception goes against the primary precept of reproduction. And do not kill goes against the preservation of life precept. So, you know, with those five primary precepts, they're not really very clear rules, are they? They're more like principles, if you see what I mean. And then the secondary precepts are those really specific rules which ensure you uphold and follow the primary precepts. So, you know, as I've put here, many Catholic teachings, for example, those that are against abortion, euthanasia and homosexual acts are derived from the primary precepts. So your secondary precepts are created by a government, by a church, uh, by a society, and they are designed to uphold those five primary precepts. So it's all about ensuring that you follow those five primary precepts. Um, now, uh, just a quick link to proportionalism here, which is another more modern development on natural moral law. Can you think of exceptional circumstances when someone could be justified in breaking these secondary precepts? So proportionalism, as I say, is a development on natural moral law that you should always follow the rules unless there is a proportionate reason to break them. So, you know, we're going to talk when we evaluate natural moral law about the fact that it is a very clear, universally binding approach to ethics. But then actually, we can think about this more modern development we call proportionalism, and the idea that there is sometimes a proportional reason to actually break the rules, to actually go against the precepts. And Aquinas' own just war theory, for example, suggests that there are times when you can break that precept, do not kill, for example, in war, you know, so it is really interesting just to be thinking about more modern developments on natural moral law. And we're going to continue doing that as we evaluate this uh, approach to ethics. Uh, our next question, do excuse me, just trying to read it there, um, is number 12. What does it mean to say that secondary precepts are culturally relative? So it's important to remember the distinction between your fixed and inflexible primary precepts, which are objective and absolute, and then your secondary precepts, which are derived from the primary ones, but which are not objective and they are not absolute. They are subjective and they are relative. So as I've put here, the secondary precepts are smaller relativist actions that we can do to achieve and uphold the primary precepts. And so they're going to vary within different societies and also between different people. You know, for example, you know, with that reproduction primary precept, that leads to the Catholic Church believing that uh, contraception and homosexual acts are always intrinsically wrong, whereas other churches might to take that in a different way. You know, they might believe, well, you know, that's not necessarily saying that the only purpose of sex is reproduction, you know. So 
you know, there's different ways of interpreting these primary precepts. And that is what the secondary precepts take into account. And that is why, as I've put here, they vary within different societies and also allow for personal interpretations. Um, so, for example, in order to preserve life, you might become a doctor, but not everybody becomes a doctor or in order to worship God you could go to church, but other people might worship God in different ways by doing litter picking to look after the world he's created, for example. So your secondary precepts are the ways in which people try to uphold and achieve the primary precepts, but they do that in different ways. And that is why the secondary precepts are seen as having more flexibility and they're relative and they're subjective to societies, but even to individuals, whereas your primary precepts are completely fixed they are set in stone and they are objective and absolute. So just a couple of concrete examples just to help us really understand what these precepts are then. So 13, give two secondary precepts that are derived from the primary precept, preservation of life. And you could say do not kill, of course, which we see in the uh, Bible, in Exodus, the Ten Commandments, and do not allow abortion. Because remember, Catholics believe that life begins at conception. So their interpretation of preservation of life is that life has begun at conception and therefore abortion would always be wrong, no matter how early into a pregnancy or under whatever circumstances. So, you know, that's interesting. Although, of course, we're going to talk about doctrine of double effect a little bit later. Um, so that's their understanding of preservation of life, that life begins at um, conception and so do not kill and do not allow an abortion. Our next one then give two secondary precepts that are derived from the primary precept of reproduction. So you could say do not use contraception, which, as I've said, is described as intrinsically evil by the Catholic Church. You could also say do not masturbate because Aquinas believes that every emission of semen must be open to the transmission of life and do not engage in homosexual acts. The purpose of sex is procreation and homosexual acts obviously are by nature non-procreative. And so, you know, that teaches in the Catholic Church, we would link back to the natural moral law and the idea that the primary precept, the primary purpose of sex is reproduction. And, you know, if you're not achieving that in your life, then you are not going to go to heaven. You're not going to achieve eudaimonia, which, again, is a great opportunity for evaluation. Do you think you need to reproduce in order to live a good life? Aquinas is saying yes. Um, but, you know, this is where you get to bring in your evaluation points. You could say that actually in the world today where overpopulation is such a problem and some people are naturally infertile, does it seem right to say that reproduction is one of those five primary precepts? OK, so we're going to look now at a modern development of natural moral law. And this comes from John Finnis. So he uh, developed natural moral law in the 20th century. And he is the author of a book, just to give you a bit of background on him, uh, which was called Natural Law and Natural Rights. And he wrote this in 1980. So, you know, this is a really great example of a contemporary development of natural moral law, which is always great when you're talking about an ancient ethical theory, because it allows you to show that it does remain relevant because people are still writing about it, they're still developing it, they're still using it. So Finnis argues that there are certain basic goods that are self-evident. So this is very similar, I hope you're seeing, to that idea of primary precepts. There are certain things that are self-evident to be right. For example, preservation of life, reproduction, uh, education of children, which Aquinas would say is self-evident to be a good thing, to be the right thing to do. Hence the fact that they are free of his five primary precepts. Now, for Finnis, he believed it is better for humans to live in a civilised society with laws that uphold these basic goods. And he believes that ethics is about finding a way to ensure humans can flourish. And again, that word should be making you think instantly of Aristotle and his idea of telos and flourishing. And it's about working together for the common good. So it's about not only the flourishing of individuals, but the flourishing of the entire society. Now, he proposed his list of seven primary slash basic goods. So we're not talking about precepts here. He develops this idea of there being primary goods. And he believes that they are self-evident and he believes that everybody needs to fulfill them in order to find fulfillment. So, you know, in the same way that Aquinas believes that fulfilling those five primary precepts helps you to move towards eudaimonia, towards goodness. For Finnis, he believes that these seven primary goods are the seven things we need that we all need to fulfill in order to live a good life and to achieve eudaimonia. 
So the first one he said is life itself. So that would include having health and procreating. The second one is knowledge. The third one is play. We need to have enjoyment. So play is important for us. He believed aesthetic experience. He believed um, the next one is sociability. So we need to socialize. It's self-evident that we need friends. Um, and again, that is a key idea in Aristotle's writing as well, the importance of friendship, um, practical reasonableness, the ability to reason correctly for yourself about how you should best act in a situation, both for your own benefit and that of others. And spirituality, acknowledging that you are part of a natural ordered system, which is um, the object of our ultimate concern. So. Just take a moment to think, do you agree with Finnis here that these are the seven primary goods that all people need to follow? And that if we can tick all of these off, we will flourish and thrive in our lives. So just have a think about whether you do agree with him on this in terms of what he proposes as his uh, development of natural moral law, that these are the seven things that should be self-evident that will help us to flourish. And that if we can all fulfill these seven things, we can fulfill our full potential. We can flourish, we can thrive, we can be the best that we can be. So just have a think if you agree with Finnis, but you know, just to reiterate, we're talking about him because he's showing us natural moral law is still relevant. The idea that there are these universal basic goods that we need to pursue, we need to fulfill in order to flourish and uh, fulfill our potential. So I want to now talk about some um, strengths and weaknesses of natural moral law. So we're gonna move now to our evaluation. So obviously the stuff about finish there is very important with our evaluation because it shows natural moral law remains relevant. If there are contemporary developments of something, it shows that even if its origins are 2000 years ago in the writing of Aristotle, it remains relevant. It's something that human beings still need to know about, they need to follow. So, you know, we've got a third strength there in Finnis's work, but I want to talk about John Waters because he gives us a brilliant quote for our evaluation. So in the same way that we want to memorize Cicero's quote, he gives a really brilliant soundbite when it comes to the strengths of natural moral law. So John Waters argues that natural moral law offers a foundational, universal and absolute approach to ethics. So that is the phrase I would get written down on a post-it note and that I would have, you know, stuck on my wall to memorize. And this, of course, reflects Cicero's original declaration that natural moral law is of universal application, unchanging and everlasting. It is one eternal and unchangeable law binding upon all people at all times. So why is that a good thing? Why are we saying that is a strength? Well, of course, it ensures that there is an objective foundation for ethics, and that gives people a very clear and universally applicable sense of right and wrong. And we see that as a strength because it means everybody is on the same page, you know, and we see this, and here's a really great thing to include in your evaluation in the UN Declaration of Human Rights, for example, which is an example of a universally binding code of conduct. So it shows us that, you know, natural moral law has laid the foundations for, you know, the UN Declaration of Human Rights, no less. It shows us that this is a helpful approach to ethics. The idea that there are certain rights that we all have and there are certain responsibilities that we all have. And you could say that in the 21st century, in the postmodern world that we live in, people value an unchanging and absolute source of moral truth. Those clear common rules that are common to everybody create stability and certainty in our ethical decision making. The idea that no matter what country you go to, there are certain rights that you have that are going to be upheld and there are certain responsibilities you know you need to honour, you need to fulfil and follow. For example, to not go around killing people. So, you know, this is a real strength of natural moral law, that it offers this foundational, universal and absolute approach to ethics, which means it's really clear in terms of giving us a code of conduct to follow. And it's really helpful in giving us this framework for human rights, for example, so that everybody's rights are respected and everybody knows what responsibilities they have. So Waters there giving us a real strength of natural moral law, which will really impress your examiner if you can refer to him as a key scholar in your answer. 
So just in terms of that, then, how has natural moral law influenced contemporary rules and laws? So this is question 17. So, of course, we've mentioned the Catholic Church a lot, and we know that Aquinas is very much associated with Catholic Church teaching and doctrine. So, you know, natural moral law has influenced the church. Many of its teachings are derived from the primary precepts, for example, its opposition to abortion, euthanasia and homosexual acts. And of course, it also, as I've just mentioned, lays the foundation for human rights, the UN Declaration of Human Rights of 1948, for example. It's that idea that everybody has natural rights and responsibilities that need to be upheld, that everybody's, you know, right to life, for example, needs to be respected because of that precept preservation of life. So, you know, this theory, this ethical theory has paved the way for that modern understanding of human rights. Number 18, then, why might some atheists reject the use of natural moral law? So, of course, this is going to be a key weakness that we've just said. This is a universal um, and universally binding approach to ethics that everybody can follow. We're instantly now thinking, but is it? Because the whole theory, the whole approach assumes that there is a God. So you could argue that it's actually now outdated because, you know, today many people don't believe there is a divine law. People don't believe that one of the five primary precepts should be the worship of God. You know, this is an ethical theory that is dependent on, that is based on belief in God. And so you could argue, you know, is a really great criticism of natural moral law, that it only works for a theist who believes that God has created a natural law for us to all discover. Atheists may assert that the use of reason, which Aquinas has said is so important, actually leads us to question whether there is a God at all. So, you know, this is a great criticism of natural moral law, that actually there is no God who has got this eternal law in his mind that he has then revealed in scripture through the divine law. And that if you look at the natural world, you're going to see his natural law. You know, if you don't believe there is a God in the first place, then you, you don't believe that there can be this eternal law that is therefore binding upon all people at all times. So a great synoptic link here is metaethics, as we've mentioned before, and emotivism, because your emotivist um, and your emotivist philosophers such as AJR would say that all moral judgments are expressions of opinion. There is actually no objective right, wrong or goodness that is out there, you know, never mind in the mind of God, but absolutely anywhere at all. All morality is a, is a, a matter of personal preference and opinions. And another great criticism, actually, is your naturalistic fallacy, which we link with G.E. Moore, who you'll also know from Matter Ethics. And he said that just because something is natural, that doesn't necessarily make it right. So, you know, really important that we are thinking, right, well, what are the flaws with natural moral law? What might turn some people off it, if I can put it like that? And of course, that dependence on belief in God could be a really great example. Now, you know, you could respond to that your rebuttal could be but John Finnis has developed it in a way that is much more applicable so for example um if you think about his uh, seven basic goods the seventh one is spirituality or one of the seven is spirituality so he's not necessarily saying you have to believe in God you know he leaves that a bit more open so you could say that modern developments have actually responded to this problem by removing dependence on belief in God but certainly you know Aquinas's natural moral law in its original form is you know based on belief in God so if we want to make a link to language games here why not make a link to Wittgenstein you could say this only works within a theistic form of life. If you don't play the theistic language game, this is going to have no meaning for you. The language of uh, natural moral law is meaningless because if you don't believe there is a God, then where is that eternal law coming from in the first place? And if you don't believe there is a God, why would you think that one of the five primary precepts should be the worship of God, if that makes sense? So another criticism, we're being quite critical of natural moral law now, is uh, that people see it as outdated on sex ethics. So why is that? Well, you could say, you could argue in the essay that natural moral law promotes a rigid uh, traditional understanding of sexuality, which is outdated, which is no longer relevant, which many people today would not agree with or endorse. So the primary precept of reproduction, you won't be surprised to hear has come in for particular criticism because it's led to a very specific view of sex and the purpose of sex. 
And that, of course, has led to the condemnation of things that have been quite normalized in Western society, at least uh, masturbation, contraception and homosexual acts. So modern Western society would not see these things as necessarily harmful in themselves. They're not illegal in the UK, for example, although, of course, the Catholic Church does maintain its opposition to them. We could also go further and say, actually, now. Excuse me, guys, just having some water. Do keep hydrated. Uh, overpopulation and STIs are an issue. And so natural moral laws position may actually be irresponsible, demanding that everybody reproduces, demanding as a consequence that nobody uses contraception, as the Catholic Church insists. You could say, again, that's outdated. It's irresponsible. It's not going to work. The Church of England, for example, today supports the use of artificial contraception within a Christian marriage. The Lambeth Conference of 1930 decided it can be used in the light of Christian principles. And then the Methodist Church, for example, allows same sex marriages, which are now, of course, legal in the UK. Um, and so you could say natural moral law is outdated or that those primary precepts lead to outdated rules, such as against contraception or homosexual acts. Um, and a great point actually here is from Podgeman, who said we have, humans have many purposes. So again, linking it back to this question of telos. Heterosexuality may serve one social purpose, whereas homosexuality serves another. And both may be fulfilling for different types of individuals. So, you know, who is Aquinas to say that being in a homosexual relationship where you don't have kids is not going to be fulfilling for you? Why could that not be the purpose someone has within a diverse society? You know, why does everybody have to pursue purpose and pursue goodness? And remember, that's his focus on doing good and avoiding evil in the same way. Why could homosexuality not be the way to fulfill someone's purpose? They could be contributing in different ways as a doctor, as a teacher, for example. So, you know, it's quite narrow, you could argue, in terms of restricting the purpose of sex to reproduction, but then also the implication it has for people who are homosexual, for example. Now, obviously, homosexuality wasn't understood as a orientation in Aquinas's day. But again, you could use that as your further criticism that it is now outdated. It doesn't apply very well to the modern world, not least because many people don't believe in God, but also because this idea of you know sexual morality and its position on sex ethics is now outdated as well 20 then question 20 we're nearly there guys what does it mean to say that natural moral law is too rigid for real life so again another criticism here so obviously we said a strength is that it is clear and consistent and as Cicero said there will be one law eternal binding upon all people at all times but you could actually then criticize that so you've said in your essay how brilliant it is that it's so clear consistent and universally binding but you could then actually um you know as a rebuttal to that say that doesn't work in practice. It sounds great on paper. It sounds lovely in the textbook, but in real life, it's not going to work because modern life is complex. There is not necessarily one size fits all when it comes to morality, ethics and moral decision making. So you could say that natural moral law, for example, the five primary precepts are too rigid. It's impractical to try and apply all five in your life. They cannot be applied in real life at all times. You know, making moral decisions requires we consider the situation and the specific circumstances. Now, you know, a key rebuttal you could make there is that but you've got the secondary precepts which do introduce flexibility and you could also bring in the doctrine of double effect which we're going to talk about in a moment which does allow you to have a bit more flexibility in your decision making however you know the criticism we could say still stands because it's saying there are five things which are always right and must always be followed but actually joseph fletcher said there is one thing and that one thing is love yeah so is it that there should be five primary precepts or should there just be one ruling principle for fletcher for example in situation ethics which we've also studied for the course he believed there was only one thing and that one thing is love so you can use you know different ethical theories to critique each other and I really encourage you to do that. It will impress the examiner and it allows you to show off your knowledge of the wider course. Um, so as I say, Fletcher's situation ethics is based on the idea that there is only one ruling principle and that is love. And, you know, we see that in the writing of William Temple, a former Archbishop of Canterbury, so 20th century Christian scholar who said that love is the only universal. 
because as Fletcher put it, the morality of an action is dependent on the circumstances. So, you know, you could say, actually, the theory is too rigid. Let's have a look then at 21. How might natural moral law help to develop global rules and ethics? So we've touched on this a few times now, haven't we? This idea of it being foundational, universal and absolute, as Waters says. And, you know, the key strength here is that natural moral law asserts it establishes, it makes clear that human beings have universal rights, values and responsibilities. And these uh, rights, values and responsibilities are not to be created, but are to be discovered. Um, sorry, guys, I'm just wondering what this little bit of light is. <laughs> it's divine intervention. God's getting involved now. He's coming down to see us and endorse natural moral law. Um, so, sorry, where was I? These rights, values and responsibilities obviously are not to be created, but are to be discovered. Please remember that with natural moral law. It is not about um, a law being created. It's being discovered. It already exists in the mind of God. So it's being discovered. Uh, and that is really important to remember because it therefore means that people can't chop and change it. A corrupt dictator, for example, cannot erode the rights and responsibilities that natural moral law has given us because they are seen as eternal. So they therefore transcend politics, government and society. And that, of course, lays the foundation for international human rights, such as the UN Declaration of Human Rights. And it suggests that we have certain rights and responsibilities which cannot be taken away. So that's a great way to protect people's human rights universally, because it means that a corrupt dictator, for example, cannot erode those rights. So. Let's move on now to this development of natural moral law, which is the doctrine of double effect. And this is, let me give you our definition of what it is. It is invoked to explain the permissibility of an action that causes a serious harm, such as the death of a human being, which of course would go against the preservation of life primary precept, as a side effect of promoting some good end. So for example, if you are attacking in self-defense and your intention is to save your own life, then you would be justified or you would be absolved from blame. So Aquinas wrote this. He said nothing hinders one act from having two effects, only one of which is intended. He said, accordingly, the act of self-defense may have two effects, one, the saving of one's life, the other, the slaying of the aggressor. Therefore, this act, since one's intention is to save one's life, is not unlawful. So what he's saying is that if you are attacked, if you were attacked, and if you struck out at your attacker in self-defense and they ended up dying, then your action, even though it's led to their death, would not be unlawful. It would not be wrong. And so you would not be punished for it because, and this is important, your intention was to save your life. Your intention was to preserve your life, to use the language of the precepts. And so if as a side effect of that, somebody has lost their life, then you don't need to worry, is what he's saying, because that was the side effect. Your intention, the good you were trying to achieve was to preserve life. So obviously, if your intention had been, I'm not having this, I want to kill you, and therefore you'd killed them, that would be wrong. But he's saying there is a big difference between intention and foresight. So if your intention is that you want to defend your life, you want to preserve your life, then that's OK. Even if you had foresight, foresight, excuse me, that doing so in that particular way could lead to the loss of their life. As long as your intention is to save life, then you are not going to get into trouble with Aquinas, is basically the key point here. So he believes whenever we act, there is a difference between intention and foresight. And he believes that we're only responsible for one thing. So when you act, he says, you are always going to think of your intention, what you intend to do, what you want to achieve. And then you will also have what he calls foresight. And this is what you know could happen as a result of your action, but it is not your intention. So, you know, he says you can have the intention to do something alongside foresight of what could happen when you do that thing. So this is knowledge of a potential outcome. 
So we like to see this, I like to see this as an awareness of an unintended but foreseeable side effect. And so the example I will use again is striking out in self-defense. When somebody attacks you and you are striking out to defend yourself, your intention is to defend yourself. Now you can still therefore have foresight that that action that you perform could kill that person or it could harm them. But Aquinas is saying you're only responsible for your intention. So if your intention is to preserve your life, then that's what you're responsible for. And therefore, you are morally clear. Because even though you had foresight, that action could harm your attacker, your intention was to preserve your life. And so, as I say, you're not going to be getting into trouble with Aquinas. Now, the doctrine of double effect is widely applied, and we're going to look at some applications in a minute. But in order to invoke it, in order to use the doctrine of double effect um, to talk about the permissibility of an otherwise morally wrong action, you have to satisfy these four conditions. So the first one is the nature of the act condition, that the action itself must be morally good or neutral. The second one is the means end condition. The bad effect must not be the means by which the good effect is achieved. The third one is the right intention condition. The intention must only be to achieve the good effect. And then the fourth one is the proportionality condition. The good effect must be at least equivalent in importance to the bad effect. So, you know, saving my one life, for example, um, you know, could not necessarily justify an act of self-defense, which ended up with 500 other people dying, you know, so it's got to be proportional. So let's apply this and think, I think, hopefully, this will help it to make more sense for us. So 25, apply the doctrine of double effect to the example of self-defense. So as Aquinas said, as I read to you before, nothing hinders one act from having two effects, only one of which is intended. Accordingly, the act of self-defense may have two effects, one the saving of one's life, the other the slaying of the aggressor. Therefore, this act, since the intention is to save one's life, is not unlawful. So as I said, your intention in striking out is to preserve your life. The death of the attacker would be a foreseeable but unintended side effect of this. It is morally acceptable, Aquinas believed, to kill someone in self-defence if your intention is to save your own life and their death is as an unintended but foreseeable consequence slash side effect. And the reason simply is because your intention was not to harm them, but to save yourself. So their harm or them being harmed is the second effect. But the primary effect is preserving your life. Your intention was to preserve your life, to save yourself. So that's an application to self-defense. Our second application is to uterine cancer. So here's the case study. A pregnant woman is diagnosed with uterine cancer and uterine cancer is cancer of the uterus. So um, I want you to imagine, for example, that the woman has found out she is pregnant. So, they've, you know, had a positive pregnancy test and they know that they're pregnant but then very sadly they've also received the news that they have uterine cancer and the only way to remove the cancer is to remove the uterus but of course removing the uterus would result in the ending of the pregnancy so in this case the question is what would you do yeah so what is the right thing to do because we know that removing the uterus is obviously going to remove the cancer, which is a good thing, it's going to save the mother's life, but that doing so is also going to bring an end to the pregnancy. So uh, the doctrine of double effect would say it is permissible to remove the cancerous uterus and so therefore also terminate the pregnancy if this is the only way to stop the spread of the cancer and if the doctor does not intend to end the pregnancy only to remove the cancer so if the intention is to remove the um cancer it would obviously be foreseeable that that will also end the pregnancy but that is not the intention you're not ending the pregnancy to get rid of the cancer you are getting rid of the cancer and you know that a foreseeable side effect uh, but an unintended side effect will be the end of that pregnancy. So, of course, the good effect, the removal of the cancer, does not follow from the bad effect, the termination of the pregnancy. So it's, as I say, a foreseeable but unintended 
side effect. So it would be justified under the doctrine of double effect. Um, and another example of that is the ectopic pregnancy, where the fertilized egg implants in the fallopian tube. And, you know, there's no other solution but to obviously uh, remove that um, because that's going to endanger the mother's life. And, you know, the, the chance of the baby developing and being born is zero. So it's, you know, another situation where the intention behind the action is to save life. But as that foreseeable but unintended side effect, you're going to bring to end that potential, that developing life. OK, 27, another application for you. Apply the doctrine of uh, double effect to the example of tactical bombing in comparison to terrorist bombing. So imagine a terrorist attack. So a terror bomber, they are aiming to bring about civilian deaths in order to weaken the resolve of the enemy, of the population. Yeah, so they are killing civilians because they want to kill them, obviously, but they want to terrify the rest of the population. In contrast, you know, so just to be really clear about that one, the terror attacker intends to kill civilians. That is the primary purpose of what they're doing. You know, they're targeting a plane, a train, a public place. They want to kill civilians. In contrast, then, you have a tactical bomber who is aiming at a military target. For example, they are bombing an ammunition factory, which is developing loads of bombs for the enemy, which they're going to use to prolong the war and kill even more people. So they might aim at that military target, that factory, even if it's in a highly populated civilian area, you know, with the foresight that bombing that factory will kill civilians, that they will die. Because when his bombs kill civilians, this is a foreseeable but unintended consequence of bombing the ammunition factory. So the argument being made here is that tactical bombing of an ammunition factory in a uh, highly populated civilian area can be justified if the intention is to bomb the ammunition factory to stop them making more weapons to then prolong the war and kill more people. And you can do that even if you have the foresight that innocent civilians are going to lose their lives because that is not your intention. You're not intending to kill the civilians living around the factory. You're intending to bomb the ammunition factory, which will, you know, hopefully stop the war sooner because the enemy will run out of weapons and will need to surrender. So the, the point being made here, the contrast being made here is that even if that tactical bombing killed the same number of people as a terrorist bombing, the tactical bombing could be justified because the civilian deaths are a foreseeable but unintended side effect of bombing the ammunition factory. Whereas with the terror bomber, their primary intention, the whole purpose of what they're doing is to kill the civilians. So it shows us that even if the death toll is the same, it's all about the intention. It's your intention. What did you intend and what did you merely foresee as an unintended but foreseeable side effect? So as I've put here, even if it is equally certain that the two bombers will cause the same number of civilian deaths, terror bombing is impermissible while tactical bombing is permissible. It is all about your intention. So very interesting there, that emphasis, isn't it, on intentions. 28 then, how might the doctrine of double effect be helpful for Christian moral decision making? So what are the strengths of this doctrine? What are the strengths of this development on natural moral law? So we could say it is realistic um, because it helps to solve the problem of when two moral goods conflict. If we apply this to euthanasia, for example, you can't always relieve suffering and preserve life. If you're giving people an increased dose of painkiller, for example, sometimes you risk ending the patient's life in your attempts to reduce the pain that a patient suffers. So it helps you to resolve those conflicting moral goods. It also introduces flexibility to moral decision making because it considers how the means must be proportional to the good end. So it adds more flexibility, It is not as rigid as natural moral law is in its original form. 
we can say it has a wide range of applications. And obviously, we've just looked at those, haven't we? We've seen that it can be applied in a military context, in a medical context, uh, in a self-defense context. And also, we can say it makes sense to take intentions into account because we cannot separate actions from the intentions behind them. So it is important that we consider the intentions people have when we're judging their actions and we're making moral judgments about their decisions. However, 29, how might the doctrine of double effect be problematic for Christian moral decision making? So what could our weaknesses be? You could say that we are actually responsible for all the consequences of our actions, especially those we have foreseen. So, you know, actually, you can't just say, well, that was an unintended side effect and absolve yourself of blame. Actually, you've got to take responsibility for all the consequences of your actions. Uh, if you can see the effect of your action, you have to take moral responsibility for it. You can't get out of trouble by deciding you only intended the effect that suits you. So you can't just then say in court, well, I didn't mean for that to happen because, you know, the judge is going to say, but it did because of what you chose to do. You could say it relies too heavily on intentions. You know, as we've said, when we spoke about the deontological teleological distinction, all the way back with question one, some ethicists believe that you should assess morality by actions rather than intentions. They think that some acts are objectively inherently right or wrong and that the intention of the person does not matter. You know, someone could lie about their intention, couldn't they? They could say, well, it wasn't my intention that that happened, even if it was. There's no way of objectively judging whether something was someone's intention before they acted. You know, what we have to work with is actually what they've done. So surely that should be our focus when we're making moral judgments. And then finally, you could say it could be misused or become what we call a slippery slope. So the doctrine could be misused to excuse any kind of action by claiming that you actually had a good intention because there's no way of proving someone's intention, only their actions. So that brings us finally. Oh, no, that doesn't bring us finally. That is the end. Do excuse me. I apologise. I thought there were 30 questions. But no, there we go. We've got an early finish today. So thank you for joining me. <laughs> Took me by surprise. Uh, and thank you for making it to the end of the video. I do hope that's been helpful for you. Very good luck with your studies. Have a great day and hopefully see you again soon. Take care. Bye bye.